From mommy vlogging to handcuffs, nobody could have predicted the extremes this mother would go to off camera. I gotta talk to you right now about this story that is just absolutely shocking to hear. This may be the biggest YouTube scandal to date. I do want to warn you, the allegations are incredibly disturbing. So intense that the Daily Mail has described her household as the Utah House of Horrors. A controversial YouTube star out of Ivan's has been arrested. For what of all things? Child exactly the opposite of what you would think with somebody who was, uh, you know, kind of got famous for giving parenting advice. And while one moment of courage from Ruby's 12-year-old son finally caught the attention of law enforcement, Police say this is the house a young child escaped from and went to a neighbor's house asking for food and water. Statements from neighbors, family, and even viewers suggest this arrest has been a long time coming. Notably, to many who had been following Ruby and eight passengers, they weren't surprised. There were rumors and allegations of child dating back to 2020. If a picture's worth a thousand words, you know, a video's worth a million. Heartbreaking clips are resurfacing now more than ever. Hopefully nobody gives her food. I gave you a tongue lashing that will not ever be repeated nor recorded. The situation has only escalated as Ruby turned on her own children, making jaw-dropping claims to allegedly escape punishment. She reportedly made claims that one of her minor children essayed their sibling and several other family members and children in the neighborhood. And who is the shadowy figure alongside Ruby that her 12-year-old son had to report to the police? Jody is a terrifying, powerful, convincing person that has a lot of influence and um, a lot of people believe anything and everything that she says. Yeah, she's a, uh, she's a bad lady. We didn't realize how bad. I won't trust myself and you should not trust me either because I don't have any problem lying to you. Let's delve into the disturbing digital saga of Ruby Frankie the former mommy vlogger who left the line between strict parenting and torment dangerously blurred. Since the dawn of YouTube, family vloggers have uploaded the precious, chaotic, and normally private moments of childhood to the internet, and Eight Passengers was no exception. From births to growing pains, stay-at-home mom Ruby began documenting her familial bliss through a camera lens back in 2015 as she and husband BYU professor Kevin Frankie raised their six children, Shari, Chad, and their four youngest that will be referred to by initials only, A, J, R, and E. It seemed vlogging even ran in Ruby's blood, as her three sisters Bonnie Helene, Julie Daru, and Ellie Mitchum took up the trade with their own family channels. Their mission, like Ruby's, seemed simple. Represent what good, tight-knit, Utah-based Mormon families should look like. And seeing how quickly the sisters mastered the art of YouTube by each accumulating their own substantial followings, perhaps they were the marriage and family gurus their content positioned them to be. But then why, after over 1,000 uploads, had eight passengers become inactive in January 2022? Well, it seemed Ruby was following a new guiding light when it came to her content something called Connections. It's described as a treatment program for those with mental health and addiction issues. On its YouTube page, it described itself as a different modality of healing that psychotherapy cannot offer you and claiming our training will help you transform your pain into joy. This is a place where you come to learn principles. More than just a YouTube channel and Facebook page, Connections was a doctrine of sorts that preached the way followers were meant to approach relationships, family, and essentially life. As for the creator of this ideology, that was none other than life coach, author, and Ruby's very own co-host and business partner, Jody Hildebrand. Connections is the solution. You can change. Quickly, Connections content took over Ruby's brand, and soon enough, she and Jody had rebranded the Eight Passengers Instagram as Moms of Truth. After all, Ruby's children could pack up, leave for college, and start their own lives, but Connections? That was forever. I could do this until I'm 100. As long as I can type on a phone, I can continue making content. I just cannot uh, make content around children. So as Ruby's mommy vlogging era came to a close, 
Fans and critics of Eight Passengers were left in the dark as to what was happening within the Frankie household. That is, until recent events put the family in the spotlight once again. Tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he's a uh, said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. It was the morning of Wednesday, August 30th, when a 12-year-old boy showed up at the doorstep of a home in Ivins, Utah, asking for help. From his skeletal frame, the child's malnourishment was no secret. Still, this was far from the most concerning aspect of his appearance. As the neighbor noticed duct tape around his ankles and wrists, it was clear the boy had been restrained in the home he'd just allegedly escaped from through a window, a home that belonged to Jody Hildebrandt. As for who the boy was, that would be Ruby's youngest son. Deborah, you gave the name of and that day, the 12-year-old had one request for Jody's neighbor. Call 911. He asked us to call the police. What's so he's very afraid. As for who R was frightened of, that would be the woman he was fleeing from. He says he just left through the porch at the neighbor's house. Um, her name is Jody Hildebrand, and she lives two doors up the street. And as the neighbor studied the boy for injuries, the severity of what Jody had allegedly done became clear. Okay, this boy has been... <laughs> This kid has obviously been, I think he's been, he's been detained, he's been, he's obviously covered in wounds. He's becoming emotional regarding the child's health. I'm going to go ahead and have medical stage on this one. But while R had been in the hands of Jody, where were Ruby and Kevin Frankie? Do you know where your mom and dad are? Well, actually... I don't know where my mom is, but I do know where my dad is. He's not anywhere here. No, no, no. Nowhere here. Okay. Still, it didn't take long for law enforcement to find the connection between Jody and Ruby. After doing a little digging, it, it looks like that 27 I sent you for Ruby. Frankie is going to be the one that is associated with the Jody Hildebrand. They're both showing a therapist from Salt Lake and associated through social media as well. As the neighbor sat with the young runaway and waited for police, he gave him water and food. You did good. Enjoy that banana, okay? Mm. Yeah, he, he did, did the right thing. However, the longer R waited, the greater tensions grew. After all, how long would it be before the boy's alleged captor noticed he was missing? You may come looking for him here soon, but... Uh... He's not going to, obviously. I mean, we need the cops here as soon as possible. But despite what R had escaped, he didn't blame Jody or his missing parents. He says he, uh, what's happened to him is his fault. Eventually, law enforcement arrived on the scene, where the severity of the boy's condition quickly became the top concern. 314, the, uh, wounds on his leg are pretty... Good. And officers say when they arrived, that child had open wounds and was so malnourished, they immediately transported him to the hospital. 314 Medical is going to transport him so that his wounds are in need of immediate care. But then, officers learned this wasn't the only Frankie child that was in danger. He's also saying that there's two of his sisters are back at the home as well. At Jody's house, Ruby's 10-year-old daughter, E, was discovered in a similarly malnourished condition and was also sent to the hospital for treatment. But where were the other Frankie children? While it seemed both Shari and Chad had moved out, there were still two other kids that Ruby and Kevin were responsible for. So, after law enforcement was able to locate the Frankie home through information available on the father, and may have found dad also a Kevin Frankie address out of Springville. The Springville police, along with the Department of Child and Family Services, paid the family a visit. But this wasn't the first time DCFS had responded to reports of mistreatment from the Frankies. They visited in 2020 after a Change.org petition was launched due to concerning content on the Eight Passengers channel. 
When they walked in unannounced, E and Ruby were baking bread together and doing a puzzle, Kevin Frankie told Insider after the incident. Hardly the evidence of an abusive home. However, this time, no scene of familial bonding could save the Frankies, considering the state R and E were found in. While police and the DCFS found the two other children, A and J, in good condition, without any obvious health concerns, they still took them away from home for their protection. As of now, four children have been taken into custody of Child and Family Services. That night, both Jody and Ruby were arrested on suspicion of two felony counts of aggravated child abuse. After all, just because the mistreatment hadn't taken place under Ruby's roof didn't mean she was innocent. According to the arrest affidavit, video evidence posted with Ruby and Jody in the counselor's home two days earlier suggested that Ruby was, at the very least, aware of the mistreatment of R&E, if not engaging in it herself. They were aware of the conditions under which these children were living. They can't, it's going to be hard for them to say, we didn't know what was going on. The affidavit also noticed a strange statement from Jody, who, once given her charges, informed the arresting officer that the children should never be allowed around any other kids. On August 31st, based on Ruby's refusal to speak with law enforcement, the severity of R and E's injuries, and the fact that authorities still had yet to interview A and J, who were now in the DCFS's custody, Ruby, along with her alleged partner in crime Jody, were denied bail. The next day, the two were charged with not one, not two, but six counts of abuse. These counts include the mistreatment of R and E by three different means, malnutrition, severe physical injury, and emotional harm. According to Washington officials, each count can carry up to 15 years behind bars, along with a fine of up to $10,000. For longtime critics of Jody and Ruby, the moment was described as surreal. One user pleaded, give us the mug shots, while another wrote, I would pay cold hard cash for the body cam footage. But what about the patriarch of the Frankie household? Had Kevin really been oblivious to the treatment of his own children? And if he was ignorant, was that an excuse? Viewers weren't so eager to let Kevin off the hook. As one user commented, I would love to know what Kevin was doing during all this, but he was always checked out in the vlogs, so he probably didn't even care to know. Even former legendary homicide detective Phil Waters commented on Kevin's situation. He had to be aware of what was going on, and therefore there may be some charges coming later that uh, charging him with child by omission. But while Kevin hadn't spoken publicly on the situation, his attorney had. Did your clients have a role in the behavior that's now being charged? Absolutely not. How? When he's the father and he was in the house, how did he not know and not do anything about it? According to attorney Randy S. Kester, Kevin and Ruby had been separated for 13 months, and his client was not with the children at the time of the alleged mistreatment. If he had known of or thought there was going on, he would have been all over it. As for Kevin's current priority, that was allegedly his children. He just wants to do what's best for his kids, get them back, get them under his tutelage and his fathership and, and uh, protect them. But when it came to protection, why hadn't anyone been looking out for the children before police became involved? Well, according to neighbors of the Frankie family, they had been. I want those kids to know that the community loves them and wants them to be safe, an unnamed female Springville resident told NBC. If people knew the amount of tears and time spent talking with law enforcement and CPS over the last year, I want people to understand that. And I want those kids to know that because I think they thought they were abandoned. Yes, the community was well aware of what was happening at the Frankie household. They knew Ruby withheld food as punishment, which she demonstrated on her channel. I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound like I'm like, a mean barbarian, but I told the kids, I said, I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. They also knew that Ruby would allegedly leave the house for weeks at a time with the children inside, as during this time, her youngest daughter, Jay, would reportedly wander the neighborhood for friends while allegedly not attending school. Yet persistent attempts from the community to involve the authorities and CPS over the past year had done nothing. In fact, records from Springville Police revealed dozens of calls involving Ruby's two homes over the years. But Springville Police told 2 News incident reports were not created for a majority of them. And while Ruby was behind some of these calls, claiming she was being harassed, police did respond in September 2022, when Ruby's eldest daughter, Shari, reported that she was concerned for her siblings that had allegedly been left at home alone for days. Police responded and said they saw the kids through the windows, but they wouldn't answer the door. They also said neighbors outside expressed concern about the children and that they would contact the Utah Division of Child and Family Services.
But with Ruby and Jody's recent arrest, the neighborhood could relax. Everyone is breathing a collective sigh of relief because we thought they were going to come out of that house with body bags, one neighbor told NBC. Even residents of Jody's community had allegedly witnessed signs of mistreatment when Ruby would bring her children to her business partner's home in Ivan's, Utah. Visits that, instead of bringing the musical sounds of children at play to the neighborhood, produced disturbing visuals of child labor as the Frankie kids were allegedly pulling weeds for hours at extreme temperatures. And the same neighbor that witnessed this scene also had a theory on how how Ruby's youngest boy, R, had chosen the house he ran away to on August 30th. According to the neighbor, during the holidays, that resident had given the Frankie kids cookies, a gesture that might have made R feel safe enough to go to them for help. But while Jody's and Ruby's communities celebrated the recent arrest of the former family vlogger and her business partner, how was Ruby's family taking the news? Well, when it came to Ruby's three sisters, it seemed the once inseparable foursome no longer had their eldest sister's back. In an Instagram post, Ellie claimed she, Bonnie, and Julie had tried to remain silent on the subject of Ruby over the past three years for the sake of her children. However, behind the scenes, they had been exhausting every option to try and make sure the kids were safe. We wouldn't feel right about moving forward with regular content without addressing the most recent events. Once we do, we will not be commenting on it further, Ellie wrote. Ruby was arrested, which needed to happen. Jody was arrested, which needed to happen. The kids are now safe, which is the number one priority. On September 1st, Ruby's sister, Bonnie Hulane, posted a now privated video titled, My Statement on My Sister Ruby Frankie, and addressed our running away and Ruby's arrest. For the last three years, we have truly clung on to each other and offering support to one another and I don't think any of us could have ever seen this coming. Yet, however shocking recent events were, it wasn't as if the family had been ignorant to Ruby's alleged mistreatment towards her family. We all did as much as we could legally, and you don't know what you don't know. And although Bonnie felt numb from the news, what was most important was that her nieces and nephews were safe, which she confirmed they were. And that is the only thing that matters to any of us. But, of course, that didn't make any of this easy. It is going to feel weird for me to move forward. I mean, do I just move forward? You just take it a day at a time. Times like these is where it really tests your, your belief in God. And I know that timing is everything. And... I know that they will be taken care of. I know the kids will be okay. And I know our family will be okay. And while four of Ruby's children were now in the custody of the DCFS, that didn't stop her eldest from speaking up. See, Shari Frankie was 20 years old, in university, and no longer under the Frankie roof, making her perfectly capable of forming her own opinion on the charges against her mother. And what was Shari's reaction to the incident? Well, it appeared relief. Finally. That was the word Shari attached to the photo of her mother's arrest that she posted to her Instagram story. After all, this had been a long battle for Shari. In a follow-up post, Shari updated her followers, writing, So glad justice is being served. We've been trying to tell the police and CPS for years about this, and so glad they finally decided to step up. Kids are safe, but there's a long road ahead. Please keep them in your prayers. But first, Shari needed the critics of her family to lend their expertise. I need your help. If you have links to any questionable or concerning connections or eight passengers videos, please DM them to me. It's too much for me to sort through myself, the 20-year-old wrote on Instagram. More specifically, connection stuff. Shari then provided a Google Docs link as a makeshift tip line where users could share what they know. And boy, did they share. The Google Doc quickly became a catalog brimming with Ruby's worst moments. But what exactly had the mother of six done over the years to become so reviled? Well, you know what they say. The internet never forgets. While mommy vlogging has long been a lightning rod for criticism, when it came to broadcasting intimate moments in their children's lives online, Ruby was in a league of her own. <laughs> I might dare say we're at the very end of your awkward phase. You are going to wipe and dry <laughs> this area. Can I have a conversation with you? Not the talk, not right here. <laughs> No, it's not. No, no, no. Uh, in fact, Ruby seemed incapable of knowing when it was time to put the camera down. Um, can you not comment? Um, let me you talk. Don't eat breakfast. Let me talk. Lunch. Is everyone okay? Yeah, sure. okay. 
Oh my gosh, are we hit? Are we hit? Are they okay? Are they okay? And this meant eight passengers didn't just supply viewers with family memories. The Frankie children might have preferred not to be immortalized, but the controversial disciplinary stylings of Ruby and Kevin that appeared to hinge on neglect. He was responsible for making her lunches in the morning, and she actually told me she did pack a lunch. So the natural outcome is she's just going to need to be hungry. Hopefully nobody gives her food and nobody steps in and gives her a lunch because then she's not going to learn from the natural outcome. Anger. Are you angry at me? <sighs> Let's sit. I gave you a tongue lashing that will not ever be repeated nor recorded. I am going to say one nice thing, and that is you took your lashing very well and other forms of cruel and unusual punishment. Chad today has just entered the Anasazi Foundation Wilderness Therapy Program, mm -hmm. where he's going to spend the next eight to 10 weeks living in the um, Anasazi Desert. <laughs> if you cut one more thing in my house, We're talking off. <laughs> I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, and I'm going to cut its head off. God, I'm going to be so mad! My bedroom was taken away for seven months, and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. You get your socks picked up, and don't you leave your stuff out anymore. Put them in your pocket so you can take them down to the hamper, and drop and give me ten. One. Put your hands straight out. But it was under the influence of one polarizing figure that the gap between the ideals of the Frankie household and those of the average American household widened. See, Jody Hildebrandt may have been a counselor, but what her Connections curriculum preached struck some as less by the books and more, well, fanatic. The really bizarre point about this case is she apparently was part of some parenting group um, that mm -hmm. had an Instagram page and was kind of active on social media and YouTube. It's described as a treatment program for those with mental health and addiction issues. Local news outlets also describing it as a parent counseling service, but also with that, you had insider reporting that many have accused Connections of being a cult. The core teaching of Connections states that for a person to achieve true connection with another human being, they must not be in distortion. Distortion is gonna go rawr. <laughs> it's going to come right at you and you're going to go <gasps> if if you're not confident in your principles. According to Jody, distortion can include almost any species of addiction, from a dependency on illegal substances or alcohol to exercise, receiving compliments or even hobbies. It's only through exercising yourself of these elements of distortion that you can enter capital T truth, Jody explains. Many of you will disagree with the position that I'm going to take because it'll be in truth. And you won't like that. You won't like truth because truth upsets people who live in distortions. But could clients really trust Jody's guidance? After all, she has a track record. In 2012, the Connections founder was put on probation as a counselor for 18 months by the state of Utah after discussing a patient's alleged addiction to adult entertainment with his church leaders and university. She didn't want to talk about my personal goals or my progress. She would only threaten me that if I didn't take more sessions and have my wife take more sessions, the alleged addiction would destroy my life, Jody's unnamed former client told the Salt Lake Tribune. And it appeared the unpleasant hallmarks of the counselor's work weren't limited to this patient. They were a pattern. On TrustReviewers.com, various alleged former clients characterized Jody as money-hungry, manipulative, and grandiose. And there was the experience of someone who was very close to Jody, at least genetically speaking. On the Mormon Stories podcast, Jody's niece, Jessie Hildebrandt, recently spoke about their aunt who they claimed had the entire Mormon community, including family, neighbors, and high-ranking bishops, wrapped around her finger. Everyone just trusted her that, you know, Jesus was um, with, without any hyperbole, literally working through her. And Jesse would know. According to them, they had been left to live with their aunt and grandparents in Utah after a fight with their parents. As a nonconformist, artsy, and at the time closeted teen, Jesse was everything their aunt despised, or perhaps according to an alleged conversation they witnessed, envied. She said something to the effect of, yes, being gay is evil and, um, you know, 
pleasures of the flesh and yada yada. But if I were to have relationships with my friends, if we were to like, it would be different because there's a deep emotional connection there. And that's different. And I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's called being gay. And that wasn't Jesse's only jaw dropping allegation. As far as I'm aware, she is a psychopath. Which might explain Jody's treatment towards them as a teenager. Jody allegedly believed the devil was controlling Jesse, and her cure was to get rid of specific joys in Jesse's life. I had really long, long hair that I loved. Um, I had to cut it all off because it gave me a sense of worth. Going to school gave me a sense of worth. Not allowed to do it. And allegedly, Jody's treatment only became more intense from there on. Jody allegedly blindfolded them, taped their mouths shut, banned them from speaking to others, forced them to sleep outside on a balcony in the winter, had them run up and down a mountain for six hours, and subjected them to other extreme physical and mental torment, all of which Jody allegedly believed was for the greater good. She would say, like, we have to do these extreme things because this is, a, this is spiritual surgery. And that's how she would rationalize it, is that it has to be extreme because we are surgically removing the sin. And when it came to sin, Jody was allegedly convinced Jesse was chock full of it. Jody also was convinced that I was a addict. She was convinced I was a addict. She was convinced that I had had a. She would uh, rationalize and um, validate these types of behaviors through dreams and visions. Jody allegedly forced Jesse to write out their sins and beg for forgiveness, but then accused Jesse of holding back. And then she was like, "No, this isn't it." This is not it. This isn't all. There's more. There's more. There's more. And there wasn't. So what would Jody extract from Jesse instead? False confessions. Eventually, Jesse ran away, and when detectives found the teen and brought them back to their grandparents, they decided not to put Jesse back in Jody's care. And while Jesse had spent years trying to move past what they allegedly experienced as a teenager, their story is now more critical than ever to validating the current charges against Jody Hildebrand. They're actually reopening my case that I filed um, when I was 16. And that is in hopes of helping the case that is currently being um, with these children, hoping to be able to corroborate those two cases. So had connections truly healed the Frankies or had the rigid principles, limiting views and strict rules only created a new sickness, one that tore the family apart at its seams? See, through connections, it seemed Ruby had learned the error of her ways when it came to parenting. I was a hugely disconnected, selfish, aggressive, neglectful mother. Entitled. Entitled. And that was that she hadn't been strict enough with her children. I wanted my kids to be happy, which AKA translated into, I want my kids to get off my back. <laughs> to remedy this, Ruby tightened her already rigid rules. In this home, you don't get personal space because this is my space because I'm the parent. You don't get to sneak. You don't get to hide. You don't get to have secrets. Not in my house. Do you see how loving that is? She developed new punishments for bad behavior. We told them that this year they are not going to be visited by Santa. And she adopted beliefs that villainize people with EDs. Now she's getting a hit by not eating. And she's getting a hit by lying about it. And, and you are so easily fooled that you go along with it. People who had experienced SA... And what did you do to put yourself in this situation where you're being taken advantage of? And members of the LGBTQ community. So this isn't about LGBTQ. This is about principles. If you really want to love someone, you will reflect truth to them. After all, according to Jody, the principles of connections were unbending. So when you say, how do I live in truth? I've just given you numerous examples of what you can do. Are you willing? Or are you going to tell me that that's not realistic? And family was no exception to the rule. I don't want anyone in my life who's not going to be loving. So if my child will only love me if I give them what they want, then that's, that's not really love. This takes a very strong soul because most of us are not even willing to consider not having our children in our lives. But it was no longer for Ruby or Jody to decide whether the Frankie children had a place in Ruby's life. No, that matter was now in the hands of the justice system. 
online, there have already been consequences to Ruby and Jody's arrests. YouTube has taken action to remove both Connections and Eight Passengers' YouTube channels. And while Connections' presence remains online, Shari had called upon her followers to report their Instagram accounts and unfollow them. They do not deserve such a large audience, Shari wrote in an Instagram story posted September 1st. On September 7th, Ruby appeared in Utah court over a video call from jail for a custody hearing. In an exclusive on the hearing, the Daily Mail reported that rather than using her time in court to fight for her children, the visibly emotional mother shifted blame onto one of her kids, who she alleged had confessed to watching adult entertainment at three years old, as well as essaying 20 other children, including cousins, neighbors, and their sibling, who also allegedly went on to essay other kids. Ruby did not provide evidence. The mother whose child was allegedly essayed by one of Ruby's children refused to speak when the Daily Mail reached out for comment. According to the Daily Mail, Ruby's allegations were met with an eerie silence from the court. Kevin, who was in attendance with his attorney, allegedly stared straight ahead as his wife spoke about their child. Due to the troubling nature of the accusations levied against Ruby's child, Judge Suchada Bazel stated that this child must be placed in a home with no other children. But had a household that prided itself on restricting their children's screen time and privacy really given a three-year-old the chance to access adult content? I really like you. <gasps> Hold on. I do not say that. Members of Ruby's family clearly weren't sold, as the former mommy vlogger sisters-in-law, Cynthia and Jennifer Frankie, told the Daily Mail they were shocked and sickened by her allegations. I don't know what to believe from her. I think she's lying, Cynthia told the tabloid. She's putting the blame on her two kids to validate what she did to her children. At this point, I think she'll say anything to save herself. It was true Ruby's accusations didn't seem to line up with the strict parenting showcased in eight passengers' vlogs. The allegations did, however, remind viewers of Jody's manipulative behavior that Ruby may have picked up on. Jesse talked about admitting to things she didn't do because the torture continued to escalate, while Jody insisted they had not admitted to all the sin they were guilty of. This is what that sounds like. On September 8th, Ruby Frankie's initial court hearing over her charges of aggravated child commenced, and it was clear more than a few people had been waiting to see her in court. The Zoom of the hearing was quickly filled with attendees, some of whom decided against turning their mics off as they began using profanities and explicit name-calling. The Washington County Courthouse told me they have never had this many people attending a virtual hearing before. They told me the numbers around 1,300 people attended the initial appearance. Yet, not everyone took the opportunity to give Ruby a piece of their mind. Instead, they scanned the room for familiar names. One user said Ruby's sister Bonnie, brother Bo, and eldest son Chad were in attendance. Other recalled seeing Ruby's daughter Shari and her sister Julie as well. During the hearing, the judge granted a motion to hand the case over to the same judge that would be presiding over Jody's. Despite previous reports of a potential pretrial release, it was ordered that both Ruby and Jody be held without bail. Their next hearing is scheduled for September 21st. But even with Ruby and Jody behind bars, there's a chance the case might not go to trial. The state doesn't want to put the kids on to have to talk about it again. Nobody wants to cross-examine them ever. Instead, a deal could be struck to protect the children involved. Whilst incarcerated, it appears both Ruby and Jody have experienced health concerns. In fact, during the September 8th hearing, Ruby appeared over webcam, either from or having come directly from the medical block at the correctional facility where she was placed that day for observation before returning to her usual holding block a few days later. And now, Jody is currently under medical observation after her attorney filed a motion to the court asking for an expedited detention hearing, citing the defendant has experienced a life-threatening medical issue, resulting in her hospitalization for several days, according to local news outlet KUTV. The nature of their health issues remains unclear. Amidst the hearings, Ruby's cousin, using the alias Sally due to fears for her safety, spoke to Law and Crime, revealing her own experiences mirrored some of the allegations against Ruby. Sally alleged her sisters were handcuffed by her mother and also deprived of food, despite having money. Sally described the mistreatment as multi-generational and added, to see that further down the line is not shocking, but disgusting. But according to another member of Ruby's family, the only ones to blame for what happened to the Frankie children were those directly involved. Ruby, Jody, Kevin, and the entire doctrine of connections. And in her video posted September 13th titled, I am not my sister. I am not my sister's crimes. Bonnie took aim at all four. 
I knew they were weird. I knew that they were off. Those are the things that we kept quiet about because what was I going to say? I was not going to come out and publicly say that I don't like my sister and I don't like what she's doing and I think she's weird. That is what we kept quiet about. For three years, Bonnie claimed she, her sisters, and parents had been cut out of Ruby's life, which meant it wasn't until they reconnected with Shari a year ago that they learned about what was allegedly happening behind closed doors. And while some internet users had blamed the family for not doing more to help the Frankie children, Bonnie claimed they had done everything in their power. Yet, according to the disgruntled sister, the only person who really had the power to do anything had chosen to do nothing. The one person that could have done something within his legal right was Kevin. It was Kevin's job to check in on things, and he did not. On October 6th, Bonnie uploaded another video titled, How I Told My Kids About Aunt Ruby. In the video, she explained that she and Ruby had raised their children alongside each other until connections tainted the happy dynamic. Essentially, they were counseling and giving what they had learned in therapy. They were teaching that to my kids, which was odd. And that had caused some friction between the cousins. And after Bonnie's children confided in her that their sleepovers at Aunt Ruby's house weren't fun anymore, Bonnie put an end to the get-togethers, a move her sister didn't appreciate. Ruby was really upset that we wouldn't join connections. She was upset that my kids didn't want to follow in the pathway that she was having her kids follow as far as just like mindset and way of doing things and and verbiage. A lot of it had to do with her verbiage. Ruby cut contact shortly after this, but not before launching severe allegations against her formerly tight-knit family. The things that she was accusing my parents of, the things that she was accusing us kids of, they were just flat out made up stories from our childhood. Now we can see that this is something that Jody has done is she gets in people's lives and she plants these ideas or accusations against people when that is just not true. When Bonnie told her children they weren't allowed to see the Frankies anymore, the kids cried and asked to send letters and packages to their cousins. I just said when they're 18, when you're 18, you'll be able to reach out and you'll be able to see if you can form a relationship then. And when it came to Ruby's arrest, Bonnie's family learned the news together and have been navigating the storm that followed in just the same way, as a unit. I think it's been nice that we've been able to digest it together as a family. We all care so deeply about each other's feelings and we worry how each other is doing, but doing it together, the kids, my siblings, my parents, neighbors, friends, is that we are taking care of each other because when one person is strong, the other isn't, and vice versa. Further details that have since come out about the Frankie and Hildebrandt case paint a clearer picture of what actually occurred on August 30th and the following days. Police have alleged that before his escape from Jody's home, Ruby's youngest son was tied to the ground with rope while the Connections leader applied a mixture of honey and cayenne to his wounds. Court records say two used medical gauze dressings were found in Hildebrandt's bathroom next to a cayenne pepper and honey paste. As we know, after law enforcement found E at Jody's, they paid a visit to the Frankie home in Springville to locate the middle children, A and J. However, it turned out that nobody was home. This was when the eldest Frankie daughter, Shari, stepped in and informed the officers that her sisters could be at a local recreation center. When police contacted the center, they learned that the two children had been picked up due to a family emergency. They later found the girls in the custody of a woman who, you guessed it, happened to be a Connections employee. The DCFS worker informed the two Frankie children that they would be staying with their sister Shari, but the girls refused and told the workers they wanted to stay with the Connections employee. They were informed that their only options were staying with their older sister or a foster family. According to police records, the Connections employee proceeded to pray with the girls while they packed. They were then put in the custody of DCFS. Despite these troubling details from the events of August 30th, Kevin Frankie's lawyer, Randy Kelster, has continued to vouch for his client's ignorance to Ruby and Jody's alleged mistreatment of the children. In an interview with People, 
Kelster claimed Ruby and Kevin had separated to save their marriage after Ruby told her husband that his attitude was infesting the family. Jody then allegedly ordered Kevin to cut off communication with various people, including his wife, unless she reached out first. Ruby was only allowed to contact Kevin three or four times, Kevin's lawyer alleged. But according to recently released police documents, it seemed Kevin was guilty of his own shady behavior following his wife's arrest. The records suggest that Kevin tried to have his eldest daughter arrested on September 1st after he noticed the door to the family home had been kicked in and devices that contained electronic journals were missing. The police explained that they had kicked the door in on August 30th and that they allowed Shari to enter the home on August 31st to retrieve personal items for two of her siblings. Kevin stated that Shari is not allowed in the home and that he believes she entered unlawfully and he wants her charged with burglary, an officer noted in the documents. After police contacted Shari, she handed over the items, which included passports for Ruby Frankie, Kevin Frankie, and her 18-year-old brother, along with three tablets, three cell phones, three cameras, and a stack of written journals. The officers recommended Kevin against filing charges since this was a civil issue and his daughter did not have intent to deprive him of his belongings. Kevin's response to law enforcement's advice? Oh, just that they would be hearing from his attorney. But from what a private investigator told People on October 5th, it seems Kevin might still be holding on to a grudge when it comes to the police force. After all, he had reportedly hired P.I. David Corrington after his family began receiving threats in 2020 that escalated when a figure with a covered face began ringing their doorbell in the middle of the night. David recalled the Frankies definitely had some frustration that the police department was not doing enough and the P.I. couldn't help but see the irony in what it took for authorities to step in. It's unfortunate that it takes some of these extreme situations for the government to intervene, David told People. You certainly have to ask the question, why did this fall through the cracks in our system? But while unanswered questions like this have left the public with a fragmented puzzle when it comes to understanding the entirety of the Frankie and Hildebrandt case, missing pieces are still being filled in. And that's all thanks to recently released police body camera footage that has brought various mysteries surrounding the case into startling clarity. Take, for example, Kevin's attorney Randy Kester's claim that his client and Shari were working on bygones following the burglary allegations. Well, footage of law enforcement returning the items Kevin's daughter confiscated from the home suggested Kevin might not be in such amicable spirits. Now, explain to me again why this was not robbery. Because it's a civil issue. It's you guys are family. She's been in the house before. You haven't been in the house in a year. Okay. I'll have to do some more research on that. The internet was clearly unnerved by Kevin's attitude, as one user asked, What is Kevin hiding? Why would he care what his daughter took unless she provided police with information that incriminates him? And another user boldly asserted, Kevin's time is coming. He is not as innocent as his attorney is trying to portray him. He's done some really mean things to his kids too. He also sat by and watched Ruby mistreat and neglect the children. Another jarring spectacle was found in the body camera footage from August 30th, when officers stormed the Frankie home with firearms drawn in search of the two missing children. Police department! However, as we already know, the girls weren't found here but at a fellow Connections employee's house, a woman whose identity has recently been made public. Sir, I'm looking for a Pam. Is Pam in today? Yeah, it's my wife. Hi. Hello, Pam. How are you doing? Good. Pam Botcher, the president of Connections Foundations and, according to Jesse Hildebrandt, not only Jody's best friend, but her eyes and ears. I didn't realize that she was connected in this. I mean, I have very strong feelings towards Pam because of not not that she was directly um, um, applying, like just she wasn't like actually involved, but she was one of the people that was like constantly surveilling like they're like the surveillance of like reporting back to Jody. And while initial reports may have described law enforcement and DCFS retrieving the girls from Pam's custody as a simple handover, the roughly 90 minute exchange caught on body camera was anything but. Just put your hands in front of you, okay? Just gonna place you temporarily under wait, 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 arrest. Wait, 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 okay? wait, wait, wait. I'll explain you to you that I'll explain what to you. What are you guys doing? I've explained this already. I'm being as courteous as I can. Okay, okay? well, I'm gonna call an attorney. That's fine. Pam spent 50 minutes of her interview with police handcuffed as law enforcement worked to establish whether she had any involvement in Ruby and Jody's alleged crimes. According to Pam, she was just helping Ruby out by picking her girls up during a family emergency, in exchange for a little manual labor from the children, of course. I did make her scrub the floor and they vacuumed and stuff because I have company coming tonight out of from Costa Rica. Okay. So, but she did it of her own free will. And you guys have been clean 
Yeah. They smell my house. It smells great. And when it came to the allegations levied against her pal Ruby, well, Pan didn't bat an eyelash. I don't know the full details of how mistreated or how malnourished those children are. Okay. All I know is that's the words and treatment that they used. Yeah. Which means that they are severely concerned of her well-being okay. and every child that's in that home. In fact, it was only when a DCFS worker pressed Pam about how she became acquainted with the Frankies. How did you start to know the family? How did you speak? The Frankie family? Yeah. Through a, a program called Connections. And Pam had to talk about her work in this program that the president of Connections Foundations seemed to falter. What type of things do they do with the program? Um, it's like life skills, life skills, like um, learning how to, you know, it's like be honest, responsible, and humble. Those are those three pillars of their, of their program. Viewers couldn't believe that in the midst of a family emergency, the girls had been asked to clean Pam's home. I can't believe that Ruby slaves out her minor daughter to clean house for another person. Pam and her husband look perfectly capable of cleaning their own house. How disgusting. And many are still unconvinced of the woman's innocence. Whoa, everyone's saying Pam didn't know a thing? I don't buy it. Pam should have told him up front that Ruby had called her and asked her to keep the girls. She was trying to act like she didn't have anything to do with Ruby and Jody, but she has been on retreats and vacations with both women during the past year. I think it's odd Pam doesn't seem to be shocked hearing the kids were emaciated. And that's all we know so far. The recent allegations against Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt have exposed an ideology that appears to not only be harmful to its followers, We've been warned about the disintegration of the family, and now you're seeing its um, tentacles start filtering into society. You can't rely on your neighbors to back you up. Instead, what we're seeing are neighbors who are undermining parents. But anyone who finds themselves in the path of a person following the teachings of connections. And while the warning signs might have been there. But I guess there was breadcrumbs. If people were looking at the videos and seeing that the parents were punishing the children too harshly or engaging in these kind of wild teaching and parenting methods. What's important is that neighbors, viewers, and family members acted. And hopefully this case will inspire others to do the same. The more we publicize stories like this and they see these types of things in the media, the more neighbors are like, I have to say something because if I don't, we are going to see them carried out of that house in body bags. This is the story of eight passengers, a family that once described themselves as connected, but has since come undone.